Thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, I'm sorry that I can't deliver this talk in German, um, but I'm from England. I'm notoriously bad at learning other people's languages. Um, I, uh, the MSA has been kind enough to invite me to teach this coming winter term, and hopefully I'll have le learned some German by then. Um, I'd like to start by showing some slides of some buildings. Uh, some of them you will already be familiar with. Uh, this is the um, IBA dock floating climatic house on the River Elbe in Hamburg um, by Hans Lavik. Uh, this is the famous house R128 by Werner Subek Architects in uh, Stuttgart. This is the Duvet Landscape Hotel by Jensen and Godwin in Norway. Uh, this is the Loden Ariel housing in Innsbruck by Archi um, Architektur Werkstatt with Team 2 Architects. And this is a passive house in Northern California by a development company called Essential Habitat. You may well be wondering why I'm showing you these particular buildings. And they all have their own um, wonderful sustainability credentials. But the, the reason why I'm showing you this is that I think that the link that holds all of these together is that they're all very, very rectangular in shape. They have lots of corners, and they're all at right angles to each other. And I was wondering why that's the case. They um, are in the middle of a landscape. They don't have any surrounding existing fabric to integrate with. Effectively, they have a carte blanche. The, uh, even in temperate uh, regions, the, there is a great variety in the micro and macro climates. And I would have expected that there is a greater variation and diversity in the morphology arrangement and the facade treatments of sustainable buildings. Parametric design and generative components are buzzwords in architecture today. And I think at its worst, form finding can be quite willful and it is more style over substance. But at the same time, form finding can be um, very much justified. Um, in its most literal sense, parametric design, uh, all design is parametric, that a building form through the design process emerges from a series of uh, parameters or constraints um, and these might be uh, physical, environmental, cultural, or aesthetic. Um, aesthetics is often a very sensitive subject amongst architects that we tend to try and justify building form with any reason other than how it actually looks. And I think this is a, a slightly obtrusive view or way of looking at things. Um, as Alberti writes in the Ten Books of Architecture, that beauty is actually an emergent property that arises out of finding the most appropriate form that responds to the set of original design parameters. I think also that um, current legislation uh, is extremely prescriptive and that you have environmental metrics by uh, the British Research Establishment in the UK and I think also the EPBD in, um, in Europe. Um, the it sort of suggests that, um, or promotes standardization in a lot of building, particularly in um, volumetric house building and commercial developments, that um, they manage to achieve certain sustainability targets, but that's often at the cost of architectural diversity and innovation. And the, the scope seems to be quite narrow in that it concentrates mainly on um, Carbon, and I think that it would do well. They would do well to embrace slightly more tangential concerns, but each equally crucial ones: um, things like food production, water autarky, and the form of buildings. Um, the same sort of problems uh, arise at an urban scale. Um, there's been a paradigm shift in the construction industry as a result of sustainability targets in terms of how buildings are conceived and measured and funded, but I haven't seen a corresponding shift in the actual shape of our environment. As uh, Richard Rogers says, the, um, in the contemporary city, the car shapes absolutely everything. It's the single most important determining factor um, and controls the overall shape of a city 
and the down to the spacing between buildings and right down to the street furniture, curbs, lampposts, and railings. And if we are to imagine a completely new city, which is free of cars, what would that city actually look like? Maybe it looks like this. It's uh, square. Um, this, I'm joking, but um, this is uh, Mazda City, Norman Foster's um, scheme for um, a new eco city. Um, and other than the very square perimeter, the uh, build, buildings and streets are very much shaped to meet and respond to um, climatic factors. The uh, streets themselves, the buildings that line the streets, they sort of taper up as you go up a building so that you get some natural overshadowing and shading for pedestrians. And the streets are much narrower than you'd expect um, compared to streets with cars on, so that they actually funnel the prevailing winds and create natural ventilation. When you're talking about an entirely new city, the, a, a conglomeration of buildings offers far better thermal efficiencies that are completely unachievable with individual buildings. Um, in the beginning to the middle of the last century, is um, people were very much interested in uh, organic forms and uh, what that could actually teach us. Um, this is an extract from a book called On Growth and Form by uh, Darcy Wentworth Thompson in 1915. Um, he was a biologist and mathematician, and he proposed that the that evolution was overstressed as a determining factor on how organisms are shaped, and that structuralism was far more important, which is based on mechanics and physical properties. This kind of thinking inspired a number of architects and designers to um, look at organic and physical phenomena. Um, this is um, an experiment carried out by Fry Otto using soap film bubbles and wire loops to look at how he might be able to optimize form and to minimize material and energy waste. Uh, and this is some empir empirical experimentation by uh, Gaudi for the Colonia Guel in Barcelona, where he looked at the gravitational effect on um, a series of weights and strings. Um, this is actually a replica model uh, built under the supervision of Fry Otto at the Light Surface Structures Institute in Stuttgart. And of course, there's uh, Bucky Fuller's geodesic dome. Um, Fuller was very much interested in the sphere because it's an inherently stable structure and also gives the greatest uh, volume per surface area. So biological and physical principles have um, taught us that non-Euclidean structures optimize surface area um, to volume ratios and that helps us thermoregulate our bodies so that it controls the core temperature and the extremities of, um, of our body temperature. Um, and I was wondering, therefore, why most sustainable buildings um, still assume completely rectilinear forms. And the obvious answer to this is um, cost, time, and integration, that it's much faster and much cheaper to build along a straight line, and it's easier to stack things and to integrate them into existing fabric. But I don't think that those are necessarily justifications for completely ignoring other uh, sustainable morphologies that might respond better to their contexts. Um, in regions where um, mechanical heating is required to achieve thermal comfort, the principal energy demands come about from um, fighting heat loss. And that comes in two forms. The first is fabric heat loss, which is calculated by totaling up the um, whoops with the U-value of each element and multiplying it by the surface area and the temperature differential between the internal and external environments. And the second uh, method of heat loss is ventilation heat loss, which is calculated by taking a third of the ventilation rate and multiplying it by the volume of the structure and the uh, temperature differential. And if we are to assume that the floors, walls, and roof of a building are adequately insulated and that the building is properly sealed, 
the two main variables that we can actually control in terms of heat loss are surface area and volume. Um, this is a short study that looks at how shaping affects those two variables. This is our default house. It's uh, two stories, 112 square meters in area, um, and has a pitched roof. Uh, this is um, bungalow. Um, it has a far greater surface area because um, there isn't any stacking arrangement um, and has a larger roof through which heat can be lost. And this is a cross-shaped house. The volume of the roof is substantially less than the other two because of the plan shape. Uh, this is a cylindrical house which does very well in terms of reducing the roof area and also the wall area by nature of its shape. Um, however, the, the building of sort of that scale is very difficult to plan internally. And finally, we have a hemispherical house. Um, you would have thought that that would probably give the best performance, but if you are to look at the actual floor area that you can manage, uh, you, actually, whoops, you actually lose a lot of um, headroom around the perimeter of the first floor, which means that you have to build a greater volume overall. So um, this is a quick look at um, some figures. This uh, second series of figures here uh, takes into account that you have differential heat losses between the wall and the roof and the um, walls. Um, so a weighting factor has been used to multiply the actual areas uh, to give um, a, a factored series of figures. Um, this here, the floor area equation, is the uh, surface area of the building divided by the floor area that you actually achieve. And as you can see, the cylinder actually gives you the best series of figures. It's um, 0 0.4. Um, the worst is the bungalow, which is 0 0.58, and the other three are somewhere in between. Um, shape isn't the only thing that determines the uh, surface area to volume ratio. This is some very elementary science that I remember learning in second grade and uh, forgot until relatively recently. Um, the first cube there is, has got lengths of uh, one meter, which gives you a surface area of six square meters, a volume of a cubic meter, and um, a ratio of six. And as the object or building actually gets bigger, the uh, ratio actually gets um, very much smaller. So uh, this three by three cube gives you a ratio of two. So taking this into um, a real world scenario, this is uh, Horton Cherry Lee's micro compact home. I'm going to compare that to um, a Georgian terrace in London and some high rise buildings in Hong Kong. Um, this is um, called Chevalier Gardens, and I, I often see it as a real-world application of Le Corbusier's Plan Voisin, which also consisted of a series of uh, cruciform high-rise towers. So, this is the micro-compact home. It has an occupancy of one to two people, um, and has um, a volume of 80 meters cubed. Um, each individual, uh, length, the length of each side is only 2.6 meters. And it sort of embraces ideas and concepts used in aircraft technology to make it as compact as possible. It's a fantastic building. Um, and this is the Georgian Terrace, which is four stories, um, the lowest stories of which is um, low ground or semi-basement. Um, and this is the high rise, which uh, 28 or 29 stories and has an occupancy of between 500 and 700. Uh, this is looking at the three buildings in context so that you can see the size difference. So how do they actually perform? Um, the micro compact home uh, has the smallest surface area um, per person. Um, has a figure 8.45, and it has its, uh, it's considered a 
sorry, it's considered as sustainable because of its extremely small size and that it uses less material and therefore less embodied energy and also has a very small volume that you actually need to heat. Um, however, proportionately, it's got a very large surface area to the volume that you actually get. Um, so in terms of the floor area quotient, the, um, the overall surface area compared to the floor area that you get, it actually performs five times worse than either of the other two typologies. The terrace house has the advantage of sharing its flank walls with um, heated neighbors. And the high-rise building has the advantage of uh, its sheer size. Um, in many ways, the high-rise isn't um, very relevant in terms of the study because in Hong Kong, cooling is more important than heating. Um, but the overall shape and study um, still holds and it performs reasonably well. So um, I want to show you two case studies. This is um, a, the site of a domestic house that I'm currently working on at Barnaby Gunning Architects. Um, it's in uh, Dorset in the UK in the open countryside uh, and it's a house for four people. Um, and it is designed to meet passive house standards. So you may well be wondering what shape this building is actually going to take. This isn't a house, this is um, a table in our office. It's designed by uh, Piet Hein and Arne Jakobsen, and it takes the shape of a super ellipse. Um, and that shape is seen as a very democratic form because there's no head of a table. If you actually place the table in the middle of a rectangular room, it maximizes the perimeter around which people can actually sit um, uh, without bumping into any corners. Um, this is the equation for the super ellipse, where uh, A and B are um, the lengths of a rectangle that uh, prescribe the uh, area in which a quadrant of the curve exists. Um, for those mathematical buffs among you, the parametric equation is uh, x theta equals a cos to the power of 2 to the m theta. Uh, this is probably the most famous application of the hyperellipse. It's the city square of Sergels Tors in uh, Stockholm. Uh, there's a design competition which was won by, again, by Piet Hein. Um, and his solution using the super ellipse maximized the amount of road area around which you could fit the maximum number of cars and also gave you the curved corners to avoid um, any nasty accidents. Uh, Pitheim believed that there are two essential tendencies in building, one which is uh, linear and rectangular and one which is curved, and that they both have their own inherent uh, advantages, that the linear rectangular form is stackable and uh, rational, um, whereas the curved tendency allows uh, freedom of movement and fluidity. And his solution with the um, super ellipse or the Lamy curve was a combination of these two elements. So rather predictably, the uh, shape of the house that we're designing is a super ellipse. Um, um, having arrived at a shape that comfortably uh, housed the rooms that we required, we uh, made sure that the perimeter um, was uh, divisible by a module of 600 millimeters so that you can use standard materials and uh, standard shape windows and doors. Um, this is the house in three dimensions. Uh, it's a concrete raft foundation with um, a plywood sole plate and platform framing and uh, gang nail joists that run in this orientation on the first floor. Uh, a second platform frame, and then gang nail joist running from front to back to take account of the scalloped roof shape. Um, and the external uh, cladding is in wainy edge oak, which will gradually age and gray over time. Uh, and because it's in an area of outstanding natural beauty, it will 
gradually integrate with its Sylvian environment. So the reason for choosing the superellipse as a shape, there, there are various justifications for that. The first is that in its landscape setting, uh, the, the visual appearance and overall perception of the massing is substantially reduced. Um, secondly, we've seen that a cylindrical plan or circular plan um, uh, involves quite a lot of difficulties in terms of internal planning. The uh, superellipse, in the same way that the table and the roundabout operates, um, allows uh, relatively comfortably accommodates um, individual rooms. So uh, this is the entrance, um, the kitchen dining area, a study, uh, a lounge and media room and utility area. And this is the upper floor, um, which has uh, four bedrooms and three bathrooms and a study on this floor as well because it's used as a working environment as well as domestic accommodation. Um, so as we've seen, the um, super elliptical plan shape also gives you um, a far improved uh, surface area to volume ratio compared to a rectangular building. The other, or the final reason for the super ellipse is to do with um, ventilation heat losses. In a conventional building, um, when wind hits a, a wall of a building, you get an area of high pressure um, on the windward side and low pressure on the, wind, on the leeward side. And um, what that does is that it causes infiltration of cold air into the building um, and exfiltration of hot air out of the building, causing heat loss. Um, going back to the equation that I showed you earlier, one of the other variables other than surface air and volume is uh, N, the ventilation rate. So um, the other thing that happens with rectangular buildings is that on the uh, leeward side, low pressure side of the building, you start to get um, turbulence. If you look at how fluid dynamics work around a slightly more aerodynamic structure, um, there is a far less of a pressure differential between the uh, windward side and the leeward side. And this means that you get um, a much reduced infiltration path and therefore heat loss. And also, um, you don't get the same turbulence on this side of the building. So these are some photographs of um, the site uh, taken last week. The building is arranged on an east-west axis to maximize the southern exposure and natural daylighting here. Um, and there will be a terrace on this side and a breeze soleil here. And the second floor still needs to go up. Uh, this shows uh, the insulation being put in. Um, and this is a view from the interior. Um, we're all quite excited about this at the moment. Uh, it's a very low cost building as well. Okay, I think there's a slide missing, but um, I wanted to talk also about um, integration of uh, smaller structures into larger ones. Um, one of the key elements of the uh, American dream is to have a single detached house with a manicured lawn and a white picket fence. It's all very desperate housewives. Um, but I think we need to rethink or look at the values of how um, we approach that as a sustainable form, that we need to take those same spaces and surfaces and start to reconfigure them into something which is morphologically more sustainable, that has shared resources. Um, if you are to take all of the lawns in America, for example, it covers an area of 50 million acres. And if you were to combine that into a productive landscape, you could actually have enough food to, um, um, to provide for a large percentage of that population. This is... Um, a master plan which I worked on with uh, CJ Lim and Studio 8 for um, uh, 
um, a place called Guangming, and it is um, it was um, carried up for the Shenzhen Municipal Bureau. Guangming is uh, the south coast of China and is about uh, an hour's train ride from Hong Kong. Um, to give you some idea of the sense of scale, uh, this is the perimeter of the site. It covers 7.97 square kilometers. Uh, this is the Forbidden City in Beijing. This is uh, Central Park in Manhattan. And this is Hyde Park in London. <coughs> And it's um, an entirely new city for 200,000 inhabitants. And it's a very different way of looking at things compared to a European master plan, which um, cities gradually accrete over time. This is effectively an instant city. Uh, it goes from nothing to um, enough housing for 200,000. And therefore, we need a, a sort of new paradigm or a way of... Uh, a new way of living. So there are a few um, different inspirations for um, the concept of the master plan design. The first is uh, the Garden City Plan by Ebenezer Howard. Um, this consists of a series of concentric rings um, and radial boulevards that integrate housing and industry and agriculture. Um, there's put together in the late 19th century and was the basis for Letchworth Garden City and Welland Garden City. And they're two of the, um, I think, only existing examples of built recognizable utopias um, still around. Um, there's often much criticism of the word utopia. Um, again, I would say that if you are recreating entire, creating entire cities from scratch, that you need a utopian model um, to begin with in order to understand what you're actually trying to achieve. Um, and the other inspiration for the project is um, this uh, Hulu housing, uh, round housing in Hakka province in China. Um, in the 1980s, uh, Ronald Reagan and the CIA were looking at satellite imagery and they're convinced that they'd found missile silos in, uh, in China. Um, the actual reason why it's circular is to um, fight off or fend off bandits. But um, these are still very much used and they're very lively communities uh, that allow for a sort of intergenerational and uh, clan politics of people living in the region. So um, currently there are 3.3 billion people living in um, cities, and by 2030, that figure is, is going to rise to 5 billion. At the same time, you've got um, a projected decrease in food production of between 20 and 40 percent. And um, it doesn't take a, a mathematician to work out that what you actually need to do is start to grow food in um, the city. So, as you can see here, we have um, retained the, the utopian trope of a concentric ring plan, but we've introduced a vertical element which is calibrated to the story heights of terraces, which give us um, smooth flat areas on which we can actually grow crops. Um, today, I want to concentrate on a um, single um, community or suburb which um, we have called uh, towers and craters. Um, they're optimally sized, ranging between 300 and 800 mil meters in diameter, um, uh, which gives you the sort of, uh, uh, of the optimum in terms of walking distances and, and shared facilities. Uh, this is a section through a tower and a crater. The existing landscape and morphology of the, uh, the landscape um, consists of a series of hills and depressions, and that lends itself very simply and easily to um, the terracing. Um, the green areas are housing, the red commercial developments, 
and the Orange uh, municipal facilities, libraries, schools, health centers, and so forth. So the um, terraced uh, sections of the building actually has a number of inherent advantages. You um, get better views, um, you have better solar access for uh, offices and houses, and you get natural ventilation through uh, cross ventilation. You can uh, put the buildings closer together without overshadowing so that you can have uh, denser housing and um, more compact land use patterns. Um, so this is a series of plans through a um, tower and a crater. Uh, tower here, an integrated crater here. Um, this is one of the typical plans at one of the lower floor levels with uh, commercial development around the perimeter. Um, this is um, car park level. The city itself is car free, but um, cars are very much still seen as a, a, a valuable commodity in China and we couldn't do away with them completely. So this is car parking for visitors and for residents who actually go further afield out of the city. Um, this is the first ring of uh, accommodation dwellings, a um, department store here, and a waste recycling center here. Um, it, there's also biogas generation on site, which um, takes the waste from urban living and uses that to feed into fertilizer for the, um, the agricultural activities so that you effectively get a closed virtuous cycle. Uh, this is one of the upper levels. Uh, the dwellings have now become double loaded um, and you can see the, the horizontal farming surface areas here and around the perimeter. Uh, this is near the top with the uh, suburb square here and a reservoir in the center which is used for uh, rainwater collection and for evaporative cooling and as a backdrop for um, social activities. And this is uh, right at the top of the building. Um, each uh, community is self-sufficient, but it has what we call a center of excellence at the top, which gives it an identity. It might be a library or university building or um, museum. And there is a funicular transport system that takes you up right at the top of that, and uh, a sky cable system that takes you to other communities. Um, at a domestic scale, the circular form, as we've shown, has lots of inherent difficulties of planning. At the scale of a suburb, you have a whole series of very exciting opportunities. Um, if you have a sort of centralized hub, then you can access the maximum number of dwellings in order to uh, feed into transport systems and sustainable um, uh, sorry um, so the um, circular plan means that you have um, reduced travel distances to any uh, actual destination and you're never more than 400 meters away from something that you'd need to access on a daily basis or a transport hub. Uh, this is the vehicular uh, transport circulation system. And this is the cooling strategy for a tower community. Um, at its heart or at the nucleus is a interseasonal heat transfer labyrinth. Um, normally these are built out of concrete, but in order to reduce the embodied energy, this is actually made out of the uh, crushed rock used from excavation so that you've got the interstitial spaces between the rocks that um, cool the air coming in. So you've got a constant temperature in the earth of about 22 degrees centigrade. Um, and um, this means that the air is cooled inside the lab in the labyrinth and is dispersed 
gradually through to the various uh, apartment blocks. And this graph um, shows this blue line here is the uh, temperature of the air coming into the apartments. The red is the uh, external air temperature and the blue line, the dark blue line here, shows the actual temperature resulting in the apartment. And um, the projection suggests that we wouldn't need to have any air conditioning at all, which is often seen as a, a necessity in, in that part of the world. Um, there's a similar uh, cooling strategy for the commercial department store. Unfortunately, we couldn't do away with mechanical cooling altogether, uh, but we can reduce the demand by about 50%. Um, there are solar chimneys at the top of the department store which draw air upwards as the air gets warmed. Um, the air is drawn in through the um, sides of the building into the car park, which, um, again, the air temperature is at a temperature of about 22 degrees, and is drawn up, the cooler is drawn up, up the external walls of the um, department store to cool it. The air can't be used for ventilation, um, but it can be used for cooling. And at the top of the, uh, of the crate, uh, the tower community is a reservoir which uses evaporative cooling. So the other thing is that the circular form encourages social and community interaction, which is something that is often forgotten uh, when we talk about sustainability and I think is equally essential to build social capital between um, various um, communities. Um, <clears throat> each community has its own suburb and square and high street and schools and health centre. Um, but the circular form also deals with the uh, clan politics that I discussed earlier in the Hakka housing. Um, this is a rendering showing how the city might appear. And I just want to finish with um, a short word about vernacular housing. This is um, from Earth Housing in Kelder in Iceland, uh, built in the 12th century. Um, and it seems to me that there are lots of lessons that we can learn about it, that um, the materials are uh, what you can find locally, out of necessity, that there's stone immediately below the earth, and there are uh, trees about, um, which explains the materials used in the housing. Um, and a lot of thought has gone into passive heating and cooling, um, the solar angle, the grading. And these are things that, until very recently, we seem to have forgotten about, that um, technology has allowed us to build virtually anything, anywhere, anytime, which has resulted in a rectangular um, orthogonal buildings that with mechanical heating and cooling systems and insulation and triple glazing, it doesn't really matter what the shape of a building is anymore. And I think that's a great loss that with all of these new advances in technology that we could use those and integrate them into more sustainable forms that um, are responsive uh, to the environment in a, a far more healthy way. Thank you.